Two and a Half Admins, episode 188. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. TrueNAS Core 13 is the end of the FreeBSD version. This was a surprise for me coming from iX Systems. Even after they began pursuing scale, I really did not expect them to move this quickly to a Linux-only distribution because it is a company with such a rich FreeBSD history. Yeah, although looking at how little maintenance the FreeBSD version had gotten for the last couple of years while they focused on scale, it seemed pretty inevitable. I was mostly heartened to see that they're actually going to release another version of TrueNAS Core based on FreeBSD 13.3 because the version they have out now is based on an end-of-life version. What I find interesting here is that the enterprise version of TrueNAS hasn't made an announcement yet. And while that's still based on the FreeBSD version, I'm assuming it, it will eventually switch over to the Linux version, but it's always purposely lagged behind the free versions. So I don't know what the timeline for that looks like yet. I don't normally use the enterprise version, Alan. About how far does it usually lag behind core? It's mostly long enough that anything that people might find wrong with it gets fixed before it goes into the enterprise version. I've not honestly tracked it very closely either because I've only seen it in customers' deployments a couple of times. I've not ever set one up myself. One thing that certainly leaps to mind about making an announcement about uh, TrueNAS Core, but not about the enterprise version, I have no idea how or if this does truly play into it, but it occurs to me you would not want to announce a change to the enterprise version until you really had your uh, all your I's dotted and your T's crossed about some kind of a migration wizard to take those enterprise clients, you know, seamlessly from the FreeBSD version to the, the Linux version. Yeah, and it might be that the plan is not to do that, but to continue to support the FreeBSD version until all that hardware is end of life and just have new installs be Linux. My understanding is it's pretty straightforward to migrate the ZFS stuff and Samba and whatnot, but any VMs that you have are going to be Beehive versus KVM in the Linux version. So there's not really a path to migrate that, is there? The disk images can be converted. Like It would just be changing the configuration to use the other hypervisor. There's nothing that special about Beehive versus KVM. But the big thing is with TrueNAS Enterprise is it's specifically tied to the hardware, right? Like you don't just run it on whatever hardware you want. TrueNAS Enterprise is bundled with very specific hardware that supports their HA scheme and will have a limited warranty. And it is likely they will just use the end of the warranty on that hardware as the way to tick over rather than having to deal with upgrading. But at the same time, with the way TrueNAS is built, the OS is completely separate from the data. So you can effectively just replace the OS and then import the pool and not have to worry that much about you know trying to do an in-place swap from BSD to Linux or vice versa. Well, that sort of depends on what you're using it for. If you're just using TrueNAS as a NAS, then yeah, absolutely. Everything's easy. The problem is that TrueNAS has never really been just a NAS. What happens when you've got jails, when you've got VMs, when you've got this and that and the other? You know, it's TrueNAS has always chased an enthusiast market that wants to do everything under the sun. And that makes supporting all that a lot more complex. And yeah, it's super easy to export a pool and re-import a pool, but migrating all the various little ways they've set up to manage all these fairly complex tasks, that's a little bit of a different story. Yeah, although that's generally not the use case for the enterprise version, which is dedicated HA hardware for just NAS without media plugins and stuff that, that your enthusiast market would be after. And that's why maybe it gets treated quite a bit differently than regular TrueNAS core and scale. Tackling Joe's point more directly about uh, you know the change in hypervisor from Beehive to KVM, assuming you're talking about you know a traditional virtual machine, uh, Joe, I can tell you that usually you don't expect a VM to really much notice or care if you migrate either from Beehive to KVM or vice versa. With that said, usually everything is fine is not the quality guarantee that you generally want to deliver to your enterprise customers who are actually supporting your venture. You want to tell them, mm. no, 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 we absolutely have this covered. You will be fine. And that's a level of certainty that is a lot more difficult to get to than just, oh, yeah, you know, most of the time everything's fine. It shouldn't be too hard. You can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, well, again, the enterprise version is more for the use case of we're going to have common storage with a bunch of separate compute nodes accessing it over iSCSI or NFS or something. And so 
less likely to see that kind of hyperconverged thing on the enterprise version because the HA isn't going to work you know, with instant fail over the pool to a second head, it doesn't really work if you're trying to run VMs off of it live. But if you're doing it over iSCSI, then it does work. IX systems have always been a pretty good open source citizen, right? And they recently funded the dedupe stuff in ZFS. And presumably the ZFS stuff will continue from them. But this has got to be bad news for FreeBSD in terms of a pretty significant company is not going to be incentivized to contribute anymore. Well, and... Part of that has been they've not really been contributing that much for a while now. But yes, it's, it's obviously a blow to the community. And especially TrueNAS was kind of, to, to Jim's point, a very common way for people to get into FreeBSD because they were taking this just a NAS and making it do so much more and eventually wanting to know how more of the bits under the hood actually work in order to take it even further than what you could with the GUI. And that's why, as you might expect, there's a fork of TrueNAS Core called ZVault that will continue to offer a FreeBSD version of what was TrueNAS. What's really interesting about that is the whole reason IX got involved with TrueNAS originally, back in the early days, was to stop it from moving to Linux. Mm -hmm. Back, I think it was 2007? I don't remember the date. But originally... FreeNAS was started by Olivier Cachard Lebay, who created the BSD Router Project and is really more of a routing guy than a storage guy. And he wanted his home NAS and he built this thing. And eventually, when he was done with it, somebody was going to switch it over to Debian or something. And IX came in and saved it and, and made FreeNAS and built all of that, what you see here. Well, Olivier wanted to do a Debian-based project, but he didn't convert FreeNAS to that. He made an entirely new project called Open Media Vault. It's still out there. I actually had it in use in, in one client that had some very specific edge cases in mind, so it was the best fit for them. It's a perfectly cromulent project, and in a world without ZFS, I would probably recommend it pretty easily, but we aren't in a world without ZFS, and therefore I don't really particularly recommend it. This also led to some discussions at the conference I just got back from about if things like a NAS based on FreeBSD and so on should be more of official part of the FreeBSD project rather than their own separate projects. And if that might lead them more credence, but also just allow them to be more aligned with the project, which I think at times is where FreeNAS and TrueNAS struggle with their kind of being separate from the FreeBSD project. They didn't feel that things were all pulling in the same direction. And that's maybe a little bit of the reason they moved away. Although a lot of that was people wanting Docker support and the management tools for Beehive were not mature enough to do what they needed. But isn't the whole point of FreeBSD to be more of a sort of build your own distro kit? So something like an official NAS distro for it would be a bit like an official desktop distro for it. Like, isn't it more of a just, you know, here's the pieces, make your own thing. Before Alan answers, I'm going to note that that's an excellent question, and it's basically the same thing that I had teed up from a slightly different angle. I was going to say that the idea of you know pulling distributions like TrueNAS directly into the FreeBSD project, it's a double-edged sword. It can cut in either direction. Yes, it can absolutely align the projects more closely, and it can serve as potentially a good popularity boost both for that narrower project and for the FreeBSD project as a whole. The question you have to ask yourself is, do you, if you are a, you know, a FreeBSD partisan, do you want to pigeonhole FreeBSD quite that closely? Because as things stand right now, FreeBSD is largely considered a general purpose operating system that is and should be considered fit to stand side by side with Linux, Windows, Mac OS, whatever. If you start officially supporting entire NAS or router distributions under it, under the project's name itself, you run the real risk that people stop thinking of it as a general purpose OS and start thinking of it as only a build your own special case distribution kit. That may have a point. Uh, at the same time, since FreeBSD's main market is in building appliance type things, whether those are proprietary or open source, using the NAS as a kind of technology demonstrator of some of the interesting things you can do and some of the mechanisms that FreeBSD has and trying to build more of the common bits like uh, an up, uh, automatic update mechanism that every appliance should use instead of every appliance writing their own and so on could also 
have benefits, but there is real value in what Jim just said of it does cut both ways. And yeah, at the same time, we also don't want to take the legs out from projects that are out there already. You know, there are a couple of different firewall type distributions of FreeBSD. And if there was one that was, you know, official FreeBSD, we wouldn't want to take all the the effort that people put into that and just be like, oh, well, the open source, the the real open source one is the f- official FreeBSD one, not this one that people have spent years curating. I think we have to talk about the DOJ, the Department of Justice, and their lawsuit against Apple, reminiscent of Microsoft in the 90s. We're looking at what appears to be the beginnings of another antitrust full court press. It's going to be a long time in developing, just like it was when Microsoft got sued for antitrust back in the 90s about bundling Internet Explorer. But um, I think we definitely should talk about it starting to happen. And I think this is an interesting one because Microsoft didn't have the level of just grassroots popularity that Apple does. And so I think public perception of these suits is going to be a little different. But to those of you who are Apple fans and who are bristling at the big mean Department of Justice trying to take down the computer company that you like, it might be worth asking yourself, are you sure you would even know which reason they were getting sued for antitrust without actually reading the court document to make sure? Because I wouldn't. I could name three or four different things that could be very plausibly what's behind it. Well, it's 88 pages. I think it's a whole list of them. (laughs) Well, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. But the uh, other interesting thing is also some of the precedents here. For example, the recently finished or maybe still ongoing battle between Apple and Epic Games mostly saw Apple ruled as not being in violation of antitrust for those specific items around the App Store and not allowing third-party payments. And so I wonder how much that ends up hurting the DOG's case for uh, especially the bits around the App Store. And in the end on the App Store, I'm kind of a little bit on the fence on that one in that a lot of the value in the App Store is the level of, of trust that people have in it because it's less likely to have as much junk because of the the process Apple goes through to verify apps, which is by no means perfect uh, at all, but does engender maybe more trust than than other things. You know, the, Some of the value of a walled garden is that there's going to be a lot less cruft and and other stuff in it. But at the same time, it does make it more and more difficult to get stuff in. And, you know, if you've seen some of the posts from David Hennemeyer Hansen and his company, Hey, with their email client and so on, and some of the loopholes and stuff they had to do in order to get their app into the app store and be able to do stuff, you know, because it was a, one of their apps is a calendar-based app. You had to have an account on their email service in order to use it. And so their app got rejected from the app store because you can't use it without signing up. So they had to create like, oh, if you're not signed in, you get a demo of a calendar that's not really a usable calendar or whatever, but to meet kind of a malicious compliance with Apple's rules around the app store. Let's be fair here. Some of those rules are pretty much just plain malicious on Apple's part to begin with. I am reminded of most of the first decade of the iPhone's existence in which you could not put a VPN client on it. And the reason that you couldn't is because Apple's terms of service said you can't make an app for something that we already do in the base functionality of the phone. And because the base functionality of the phone was capable of establishing very specifically an IPsec VPN with certain unnamed Cisco enterprise routers. And I want to remind you again, there wasn't even like a list of compatible models. And no, it was not all Cisco routers. It was only some of them, the ones that happened to be most commonly found in Fortune 500 and in uh, educational and you know small government institutions. It would work fine with those. But that meant that if you were supporting small businesses, for example, like I was, and you had any other kind of an, a, a VPN, whether you had OpenVPN or you know later on WireGuard, whatever, for that matter, even if you had a consumer or small office router that had IPsec VPN functionality, you could not help your iPhone users connect to it because Apple forbade them. Well, Apple's response to this lawsuit included this. This lawsuit threatens who we are and the principles that set Apple products apart in fiercely competitive markets. And I think that that is actually true. It's just that they need to be attacked for who they are. That's the thing. (laughs) Well, yes, exactly. Exactly. What makes them so good at making money 
is that all their products work so well with each other and don't allow third parties to get involved, pretty much, unless they are through very specific gates that are kept by Apple. And the result of that is a technology ecosystem that works amazingly if you are willing to pay for it. And continue paying for it. It's worth reminding everyone also that Apple is largely the company that normalized short-term planned obsolescence in the IT tech industry. That's a Steve Jobs thing all the way. This is the same guy who, when presented with uh, Wozniak's design for the Apple II with eight expansion ports, was like, no, no, no expansion ports. Nobody should be able to do anything with this device. And now back then, in the very early days of Apple, he didn't have the clout to win, and the Apple II did, in fact, go out with eight expansion ports, which were used quite heavily and, you know, had a big impact on what made the Apple II an incredibly successful 8-bit microcomputer in its day. Later on, Jobs got his way, which was, you know, users shouldn't be able to change anything. They get what we give them, and that's what makes everything perfect and wonderful and whatever. So uh, I'm really not having, you know, any of these arguments that what Apple is is anything but (laughs) anti-competitive, anti-configurable, anti-anything other than use our perfect thing the way that we gave it to you, already perfect. Well, the way I see this lawsuit is the DOJ have said to Apple, you are too good at capitalism, please stop being so good at it. I think that's fair. Arguably, that's the only valid reason for there to be an antitrust suit. Because, I mean, that is the goal of a capitalist entity, right? Is you make all the damn money. And a lot of the goal of a government in a capitalist society is or should be to keep an eye on that and see when things are starting to get out of hand and it's threatening the free market, right? There's that capitalized Reagan phrase that we all know and love, you know, the the miracle of the free market. Well, if you let any one company get too good at capitalism, then you no longer have a free market. I wonder to what degree it makes sense to limit Apple's abilities to make their closed ecosystem because of the value that it actually brings, right? The fact that you can't configure it in a weird way and that you can't plug in devices that haven't been tested with it by Apple is the reason why all that stuff works together seamlessly. And while it's not for me, I understand a lot of people enjoying the fact that if I just buy all this one set of stuff, it'll all just work together. And, you know, you don't get the problems you have with more general purpose computers where you get all kinds of weird interactions between different devices and your configuration is different than anybody else's configuration of the world and it's not possible to test all of them. Again, tell that to a few hundred of my users who couldn't connect to VPNs for 10 years. Yeah, it'll also be interesting to see Apple's response to this as we've seen when the EU has uh, proposed some regulations. Apple's like, well, we'll just stop all those apps. Yeah, or we'll do malicious compliance and do just the absolute bare minimum that we think we can get away with. But this is going to take so long, longer than the EU stuff, I think. And the DOJ is not apolitical, is my understanding. And things might be changing in the end of this year into next year. And there might be more politics involved in it. So who knows where this is going to go? It's going to be very interesting to watch, but... I don't think we can call it at this point. It's too far out. Right, for sure. There's even a handy table in one of the uh, TechCrunch articles we linked where, you know, the Microsoft case took about three and a half years. The Google case took about three and a half years. The previous Apple antitrust case that was just about buying books on an iPad took over two years. Meanwhile, I'm just wondering what Joe's ideas are in mind of the uh, apolitical <laughs> organizations that the DOJ is not one of. I don't know. The military, maybe? That's that's about all I'm willing to come up with. And even that one's kind of arguable. Well, I think it's just a little bit different in our country. At least we like to believe. At least you like to believe. I've seen enough of your news that I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this episode is sponsored by people who support us with PayPal and Patreon. Go to 2.5admins.com slash support for details of how you can support us too. Two and a half admins is part of the late night Linux family, which means that for $10 a month on Patreon, you get access to an RSS feed that contains all the late night Linux family shows without adverts like this. There's also an option to get just this show ad free for $5 a month if you prefer. Some of the episodes are even released a day or so early for Patreon supporters. So if you like what we do and can afford it, 
it would be great if you could support us at 2.5admins.com slash support. Hackers can read private AI assistant chats even though they're encrypted. Now, this is one that I found really interesting. It's actually a side channel attack, and they technically speaking can't read. Well, they can't read what you wrote at all. They can infer it. Right. They can make some outstanding guesses about the replies that came back from the AI model. Now, the reason for this is because almost every vendor out there that's you know making LLMs publicly available, they're using streaming ciphers, not block ciphers, and they're returning each individual word as the LLL comes up with it. And they do this because the LLMs are, frankly, they're, they're really pokey. Uh, most of the publicly available ones are much slower to respond than, in my experience, even like an elderly parent or grandparent who's not so great at typing can usually get their words out a little quicker than most of the LLMs can. So the vendors want you to get each word as it comes out to make you feel more connected and to lessen the likelihood that, you know, you're just going to see a blank page or a spinning circle of hate and decide, nah, screw this, I'm going to go elsewhere. Dribbling out that one word to you at a time keeps you engaged. The problem is that when they do that, they're returning a, a little bit of, of overhead in each packet. They're returning the actual token, which is always going to be the same length or within a byte of the same length. And then they're returning the actual word in clear text before it's encrypted. But the encryption, because we're talking about a streaming cipher, not a block cipher, does not change the length. So let's say that you're an adversary in the middle sitting in a coffee shop and, you know, you've got your uh, USB rubber ducky and you've successfully gotten some people to connect to your access point instead of the Starbucks, all unaware. You just watch for a whole bunch of suspiciously short packets with uh, some pretty regular and by machine standards, incredibly slow timing. They're coming in response to what looks like very normal web request traffic coming from the user in the coffee shop. When you do that, okay, now I've got a stream that's coming from one of these LLMs, and each one of these individual packets is one word plus a couple of bytes for the token. So this has basically reduced the AI responses to something similar to a, a, a wheel of fortune puzzle. So you know all of the word boundaries, and you know all of the letter boundaries, you just don't know the values of the individual letters. Now... A normal human being might look at, you know, a full paragraph of nothing but like underscores and spaces and be like, well, I don't know what that is. But there are plenty of folks who are accustomed to, you know, solving crypto quotes and similar puzzles who know exactly how to go about solving those things. So even if we were talking about, you know, back in like the 40s or the 50s, this would not have passed as cryptographically secure, understanding that, you know, you get a room full of bored housewives and you get an answer in 10 or 15 minutes. Now, you don't even need the room full of bored folks that like to do puzzles in the newspaper. You just train another model to try combinations of words that fit the letter and word boundaries. And before you know it, you very likely have an almost word for word accurate reconstruction of what it was that the AI said. And from that, you can infer what it was that the person using the AI was asking it. Now, my first thought was, well, who cares? Because I asked ChatGPT just dumb stuff or, you know, Alan's talked about before, asking it for potential interview questions or something like that. And who really cares? But it turns out that people are giving and receiving some quite personal information to these LLMs about medical stuff, for example. Dude, they ask it for romantic advice. People treat these things as though they are a human confidant with the user's privacy in mind. So there's any number of things that, that go in there that you should be concerned about. And even above like the personal stuff we just mentioned, allow me to share with you a very recent anecdote. I went out to a work site and I met a person who was an employed full-time IT professional who very proudly told me how they, quote, fixed, unquote, a Wi-Fi problem by asking chat GPT to tell them how to fix it. Now, Obviously, they bollocked everything up and ChatGPT really did not help, but that's not the point. The point is just that people are asking these things about all sorts of things that A, they really shouldn't, and B, they very likely really wouldn't be happy about anybody who is nearby being able to you know, get a good idea of what one half of the conversation was. Yeah, the example in the, in the Ars article here is literally, I have a rash, is it contagious? And ChatGPT is asking, I need some more details about your rash or whatever. And they show how the 
LLM was able to guess not exactly what was asked, but to figure out enough of the topic and so on and get a couple of words wrong, but the question is still basically the same and know what the person's talking about. And I think they mentioned that in at least 55% of the cases, they can figure out what the topic is. And in 29% of the cases, they can get perfect word accuracy of the response, which doesn't seem that high, but realizing that that's where you got every single word exactly right. Whereas when it's off by one or two words, it still means the attacker knows what you were asking about. Well, also, if you're sitting there thinking, well, that doesn't sound that high, you should also remember that when they say 29%, they're not talking about 29% of the entire conversations. They're talking about 29% of individual responses to anybody, which means that, you know, statistically speaking, if you had ChatGPT tell you something 10 times, three of those were guessable word for word. Yeah, this also reminds me of uh, similar attacks from back in the day, including the, I think it was the Leckenbacher attack, where the kind of anecdote they have for that one was, imagine if somebody took a bicycle and wrapped it up in wrapping paper and put it under the tree for Christmas. <laughs> when you see that, you don't know what color the bicycle is, but you know, sure as shit, it's not a puppy. Let's do some free consulting then. But first, just a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join those people, you can go to 2.5admins.com slash support. And remember that for various amounts on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed of either just this show or all the shows in the Late Night Linux family. And you even get some episodes early. And if you want to send in your questions for Jim and Alan or your feedback, you can email show at 2.5admins.com. Jonas writes, I'm wondering, what's your opinion on scaling a fleet of FreeBSD hosts with jails? I found Pot have a Nomad driver, and that looks interesting. But is it really necessary, or would you say managing a fleet with Ansible behind a load balancer is sufficient? For those who don't know, Nomad is a cluster scheduler, kind of like Kubernetes, but not the same exactly. And so if you had a bunch of FreeBSD hosts and you set up Pot and Nomad with it, then you could start allocating new jobs that you wanted to run, and it would pick which server to run them on for you and be able to do things like decide to move it to a different server if one server's too busy and so on. So it can be really interesting and useful way to scale that. Whether or not you need that really depends on your workload. If it's all one workload, then yeah, just building a jail on each machine with Ansible and using a load balancer may be sufficient. But if you have a bunch of different workloads and the busyness of each is going to keep changing, then something like Nomad that might move stuff around might make more sense. Sounds like the answer for Pot and Nomad is about the same as the answer for 90% of the folks who would asking, should I use Kubernetes? Which, you know, nine times out of 10, the answer is no, no, you really shouldn't. Now that remaining one out of 10, don't get me wrong. This is not me saying this is a product nobody should use. I said nine out of 10. Yeah. So it really depends on your workload. It's also Pot is a lot less involved uh, than something like Kubernetes in that setting up and playing with it is not going to melt your brain or, or ruin your machine. <laughs> so if you want to play with it, it's definitely interesting. I think there's even a tutorial on uh, the Clara website on how to do it if you're interested. But, you know, if you're running a web server or something and you just need it across a couple of machines, it is probably overkill. Right, well, we better get out of here then. Remember, show at 2.5admins.com if you want to send any questions or your feedback. You can find me at joerest.com slash mastodon. You can find me at mercenarysysadmin.com. And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.